Loving God, you who created the universe, who created this world we call home, we come to you in humble gratitude. You breathed life into us. Your hands placed the stars into the sky, and you have chosen to call us friends. May the depth of your love that we experience today in worship restore us, revive us, refresh us, so that we may experience the joy of life in all its fullness. Give us the courage, not just to talk about love, but to live out that love with all people, to show hope to those in hopeless situations, to show forgiveness and to forgive those who cannot forgive themselves. Open our hearts this day to be friends of the friendless, reaching out into this world in need of your love and light so that we may contribute to the world you are creating still. And may we go and bear fruit to reveal what is possible through love for you and for all, this day and always. Risen God, today we lift our hearts to you in one voice as we pray. We lift hallelujahs to you, Lord, in celebration of your resurrection and the promise of life which that brings. May we celebrate this joy in obedience to your commandments, finding in them not burden or hardship, but the freedom to set aside our own agendas in order that we may abide in you. Show us the way of sowing love, hope, light, and joy through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. St. Francis is known for the prayer that says, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Grant that I may not seek so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. This prayer speaks to me and moves me. I love its call to be a part of God's work among and around us. I love its challenge to live with open hands 
and open hearts, looking beyond ourselves. It brings me hope that I, that we can be a part of doing God's work in our world. I love how our church lives with open hands and open hearts, offering ourselves to each other and the world. One of the ways we can clearly see that is in our partnership in churches and communities in Haiti, Cuba, and Puerto Rico. Our members have gone time and time again. We have true friendship with brothers and sisters in those places. There and in our relationships with the people in those countries, we live out Jesus' command to love others the way that he has loved us. Over this month, you'll hear stories about our partnership in these places, and you'll be invited to give to our offering for global missions. But first, we want you to know more about these relationships and our ministry and missions there. Bonjour, comment y'est? Good morning and how you doing in the French Creole dialect of Haiti. Haiti also has a saying, dégagé, making do. As the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, Haiti has learned creative ways to make do. In the rural mountains around Grand Guave, there is little access to care and many struggle to make do. By sending medical teams to these underserved areas, we can provide medical, dental, and vision care, bring hope and a better life. In the relationships we build, the blessings surely flow both ways. And with your prayers and generosity, we are grateful for the privilege to make a difference. Bon dia beni u epi kimbe u. God be with you and keep you. I am so grateful for the time I've been able to spend in Cuba and be with those folks. When I first went, I didn't know what to expect, but now that I've been a couple of times, I just know that going to Cuba means visiting family. Absolutely. And I thank you all for the opportunity to be able to go and spend time there. And it truly is an extraordinary experience and a very important one. And I'm grateful that our youth were able to go and meet this sister church of ours that truly are a family. And they are very much praying for us and thinking of us as we are them. It's really a unique experience, especially to go to a country that's so different from ours. The structure of how the government allows church to happen is so different from ours, and it just really makes me super grateful to have that connection with Cubans and just to share the love of Christ uh, together with them. It's such a gift, and I'm really grateful. We're both really grateful for how the larger church really makes that happen. Absolutely. They have such a faith, and it's just a joy to be able to go and to experience that. So thank you for supporting missions. In September of 2017, the island of Puerto Rico was hit by back-to-back -back Category 5 hurricanes. Hurricanes Irma and Maria devastated the island, causing catastrophic damage and leaving 95% of the population without power or water. Today, tens of thousands of homes are still covered by blue tarps. Six months after the hurricanes, First Baptist of Asheville sent our first team to Puerto Rico. In the last four years, we've continued to send teams to partner with First Baptist Rio Piedras in an effort to restore safe housing to residents. Through the support of our congregation, we've had the opportunity to share our faith with our neighbors in Puerto Rico, and they have shared theirs. The blessings we've received through witnessing the resilience of this community cannot be measured. As we replace a roof, we return faith to those who've lost hope. In return, the outpouring of love and appreciation from families fuels us from day to day and from trip to trip. We return because the work is not done and our neighbors need us. Simply, 
It's what we would pray for if disaster struck here. This fall, a recovery team will return to Puerto Rico. On behalf of all who've traveled before and for those who will answer the call in October, I thank you for giving us the opportunity to fulfill this mission. Gracias. Friends, I hope you've enjoyed learning more about our special relationship with people in other countries. Christians there and in many other parts of the world carry on under very difficult circumstances. Your gifts would make a difference in their lives. Donations will be shared among these partners and the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship Global Missions Fund. All monies will go directly to the people in those countries. Thank you. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. We have the opportunity every day and this day to share God's peace with the world. Join me now in sharing it with those that you are worshiping with and those you may reach out to with a note or a text or a phone call. Let's share the words of peace with one another. morning's reading comes from John. Listen closely for God's word to us today. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. 
abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer. Because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commandments so that you may love one another. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. So I'm assuming that none of us woke up this morning thinking, 
You know, after all this COVID protocol, what I could really use is some more obedience and some commandments. We tend to brace ourselves against words like that. Words like obey and obedience and command and commandments. If you saw the, the sermon title and in the invitation to worship this week, perhaps on Instagram, you probably winced just slightly and kept scrolling. The joy of obedience. These don't sound like complimentary terms. Yet these words occur often in the gospel and letters of John. While they were trusted words for John's community, in terms of common usage today, the words obey and commandment have been in precipitous decline for a century and a half. Most of us probably haven't heard mention of these words since the last time we were in church or maybe in court. Consider how rarely we use the words obey or commandment in casual conversation. If I say to my children this evening, I command you to brush your teeth and put on your pajamas right now, I can assure you that this will move from the fourth or fifth most important thing on their list to the last most important thing on their list. Even more, who wants to hear a sermon riddled with terms that don't have the compelling power they once did? Before one of the first weddings that I ever officiated, the couple and I were discussing the service, and she said, when it comes to the vows, could you just delete the part where it says, obey, obey my husband? I'll cherish him, but I don't obey him now, and I'm not going to obey him then either. I gladly obliged, and so did he. And I, might I add, they remain a happily married couple. Now, I confess, I'd rather spend more time in the first half of John 15. Jesus leads off with the metaphor of the vine and the branches. Abide in me as I abide in you. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever it is you want and it'll be done for you. I like that. I like to imagine a lush vineyard in spring, the dew on the new green shoots as they stretch out, trying to search for the trellises for support. We feel honored and comforted that Jesus would include in his description uh, us in his description of this pastoral image, we're delighted to be assigned a role as significant as bearing divine fruit. But then Jesus strikes a more conditional tone. If you keep my commandments, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. One minute we're strolling through the vineyard and the next we're facing down commandments. We're jolted by the shift away from the warm sun and ripening grapes to words that remind us of things engraved on stones. We're plucked from the vineyard to scale Mount Sinai, immersed again in the fiery cloud, engulfing its peak to see God tucking Moses into the cleft of the rock in order to keep Moses safe from God. At least that's how it might feel when we've been conditioned to recoil from things that sound so dogmatic. If you keep my commandments, note that Jesus speaks of commandments, plural. But what exactly are the commandments Jesus is commending to us in John? And where are they? I haven't noticed any list of commandments in John to this point. After a thorough search, I must say that John is not nearly as fond of, of list as, say, Matthew is with his 12 Beatitudes and his riveting itemized genealogy in chapter 1. And there was Perez, father Hezron, Hezron, the father of Ram, Ram, the father of Aminadab. Shall I go on? Do go on, Matthew. I love when you start a movie by rolling the credits first. But John begins with word made flesh, 
a dove descending on the water. Water made wine. If we read all the way to the end of John, we never do find a list of commandments. Jesus finally distills his reference to some plural commandments into the singular. This is my commandment, he finally says, that you love one another as I have loved you. But there are here and there unassuming directives interwoven with captivating glimpses of God with us, instructions Jesus seems content to write on our hearts rather than on tablets, like, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Have we ever considered that that's a commandment? This is a favorite passage for funerals, but what if we can enjoy it right now? It's not a burden to obey this, is it? The Spirit makes us able to obey. I believe it's a relief to know this is who God is and what God desires for us. And I suppose the order not to let our hearts be troubled says even more about God's goodness than it does about our own fears. Do not let your hearts be troubled is a perfect demonstration of how God's commandments work. They aren't designed to weigh us down with more to do. And his commandments are not burdensome, says the author of 1 John, for whatever is born of God conquers the world. From the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai all the way to this gentle invitation, God's commands and teachings and even God's admonitions throughout Scripture are all given to us as gifts. The first time Jesus says the word command in the Gospel of John, he's describing himself as the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. I have power to lay it down, he says. And I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. When we obey Jesus' commandments, and I say this after my whole lifetime of being taught by cultural convention To think of church as a place where we go to learn our have-tos and our ought-tos and our shoulds and our need-tos and you betters. When we obey Jesus' commandments, we aren't following rules or precepts. We aren't being religious. We aren't earning anything, especially not heaven. We're being drawn into the life of of the Trinity into the love that we see revealed between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When we obey Jesus' commandments, we're becoming enmeshed in the very life of God, ever so surely submerged in the deep cosmic ocean of God's love where deep calls to deep and where our constant striving slaws off and dissolves. There is where Jesus' longing for us is fulfilled, that my joy may be in you, and your joy may be complete. There, where deep calls to deep, we become able to say what Paul said to the church at Ephesus, of this gospel I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the working of his power. When we obey God merely out of a sense of obligation, we're missing the mark. There's joy and obedience. There's obedience and joy. There's joy in laying down our life for our friends. Another way of saying that is to set aside our life for our friends. The author Heidi Haverkamp recently wrote 
about how she and her husband stunned a lot of the people they knew by moving to Indianapolis, not for the big city life, not for new jobs, not for career, not for retirement, but to be closer to their friends. She said she remembered when she was studying in Scotland how different they were from Americans when they would start a casual conversation. In America, it tends to be, what do you do for a living? And there, she said, it's, who are your mates? Who do you hang out with? Who are your friends? What if part of the Christian life holds a commandment to lay down our life for our friends, to set aside our life for our friends, and that's part of the joy of being Christian. Not that we have to or ought to or we must or we need to do anything, but enjoy the gifts created in God's image, given to us to be with them, to be present to them, to laugh with them, and to suffer with them. And oh, how we've missed this in our lives and know how we look forward to obeying this commandment again what is christianity oh it's that religion where god says go be with your friends and enjoy them none of us need any more to do than we already have today's burdens are enough for today. But Jesus does have so many commandments to share with us, doesn't he? What are they again? According to John, they're to believe, they're to not fear, they're to set aside our life for our friends. Oh, and one more thing to enjoy. Amen.
Friends, if you've been following along the life of our congregation, you will know of the $250,000 two-to-one matching grant we received last fall and the invitation by the Lilly Endowment, which funds the Fund for Sacred Places, to use this as an opportunity, as a spark for something more comprehensive for our congregation and especially for our wider community. It's a very complicated church process, so we have a strategic planning committee to steer the effort. And Monday night, our deacons approved the hiring of a new friend, Alan Walworth, who will be with us over the coming year and perhaps over the next three years uh, to help us and guide us through this process. He will begin his consulting services this month, and over the summer, he will be conducting a feasibility study and that means he's going to be having conversations with so many of you in one-on-one -on -one encounters and in small groups. I invite you to share your heart with him and your hopes and dreams if he does come calling. I also invite you to continue to pray for Alan and for our congregation as we discern what's right for us, for our future, and our impact potentially on Asheville as a community of faith. 
So under normal circumstances, we would welcome Alan here in person. But I want to introduce you to him vicariously again, Alan Walworth. He works for a company called Generis, and you can look him up online and get to know him better there in advance. So we welcome you, Alan, if you're watching, and I invite everyone in the congregation to extend their warmest welcome to Alan in the weeks and months to come. Now receive this benediction. God be in your head and in your understanding. God be in your eyes and in your looking. God be in your mouth and in your speaking. God be in your heart and in your thinking. God be at your end and at your departing now and forever. Amen.